Okay, it looks as though we are live and recording. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. I'm going to jump on and check that the streaming is all doing as it should be. But Molly, whilst I jump in and do that, you're in a different location to your home today. Where are you? Tell us, where in the world is Molly Robbins? Like, where in the world is Carmen San Diego? <laughs> Where's Waldo today, right? <laughs> we're, we're in um, Cornelius, North Carolina. We are visiting some colleagues and having some meetings over here. It's a beautiful part of the state. And the uh, weather's lovely. And uh, it, was, it was very funny. I was doing a consult with a guy in Chapel Hill. He thought we were... <laughs> we were going to do it face to face. I said, actually, I'm not going to be. So it's very funny. It's, yeah. It's about... <laughs> so, well, we're so good. Where, for those of us who aren't necessarily familiar, I'm obviously on the other side of the world. How far from home are you at the moment? Give us some context for those who don't know the area very well. Uh, about 150 miles from home. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, Drive. Yeah, beautiful. That gives me some context because, of course, you guys use miles. We, you, you in the United States, I should say, use miles. In Australia, here we use kilometers. Um, so the, the hours drive gives me a, a good amount of context there, and, and certainly for anybody else as well. So what? What is that? That would be 150 divided by six. <laughs> So about 250 kilometers. There you go. It's um, awesome. For you, for you know, national jet set. <laughs> not too far, but you know, uh, you're not not at home. So right. thank you for joining us, even though you aren't in your in your home. We appreciate that. I can see that there's a bunch of people who are jumping on. If you can see and hear us okay, please do let me know. I am watching along on the live stream here to to see what it is that you guys are saying and commenting and all of that sort of stuff. So <clears throat> I checked in with Morley earlier before we jumped on live to see if there was anything in particular that he would like to speak about today. And we're going to talk about vitamin D. Now, in the world of the RCP, we've been running free monthly webinars for quite some time now. We've been working our way through the protocol. If you're familiar with the protocol, you'll know that we've worked through the stops and then we're, we're making our way through the significantly larger list of starts. And every month, Molly and Chris Dan show up and they do a live free, totally free presentation for the RCP community, which is always available on replay on a topic on the protocol. And I'm pretty confident, and if Christian is here, she might be able to back me up with this. I'm pretty confident that the one on vitamin D had the largest number of signups that I think we've ever seen across any of the topics. Now, if I'm mistaken, please do let me know, but I'm pretty sure that that was the case. It's a very, very, very popular topic. So Molly, tell us about vitamin D. What do we think we know? You know, there's that quote, that's what we think we know for sure that is actually not the case. What do we know? What do we think we know? What's the problem and what's actually going on? Like, talk to us as if we haven't heard about the vitamin D conversation through the RCP perspective before, because there are absolutely going to be to be folks who are new to us here. Um, and then there'll be a, a lot of other people who will obviously be familiar with this concept, but we can never hear this too often. So tell us, what do we need to know about vitamin D? Indeed. Uh, <clears throat> famous... Mark Twain quote. Yeah. It's not what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for certain that just ain't so. Mm. I, there's a, my other favorite quote is by uh, Nietzsche. There are two types of people in the world. Those that want to know and those that want to believe. And I think the world is dominated by those who want to believe in vitamin D. And, and I don't know, it's just one of, the, one of the things that I've, uh, a strategy that I've used is to identify researchers who I felt were very thorough in their research, but also trustworthy. Mm. One of those <clears throat> turned out to be a, a gentleman by the name of Frederick Kumaro. Uh, he was a world-renowned lipidologist, 
He studied fats. He got his PhD at the University of Wisconsin in 1940. Uh, when I met him in 2012, he was 98 years old and still going very strong, still working 20 hours a week. And he had done a decade long study of vitamin D in swine. And for those who don't know, the physiology of the swine is very similar to the physiology of the human. And he, was, he just wanted to know what, what happens when you start taking vitamin D supplements. And it was not good. And his position or his recommendation to me was you never take vitamin D supplements. He said they're, they're not what people think they are. And that's a very controversial stance to take. He had reams of research to back it up. So when Dr. Kumro said, no, I dug in and said, well, let's find out why. It's been a fascinating process of discovery. And it isn't that there aren't benefits to vitamin D, but are they worth the cost? And people don't want to talk about the cost. Oh, I, I just, I know I feel better. I was <clears throat> talking with a client yet today who was taking anywhere from five to 10,000 units for many years. And he's a hurting cowboy. And his functional doctor is not aware of what the problem is. And his calcium is off the chart. Mm. And so it's just, you know, and we see this all the time. Um, everyone loves to key off of, you know, oh, but it, it shuts down viruses and things like that. It's like, yeah, you know, smothering people shuts them down too. So suppression is not down regulation. And what, what I've been studying of late is the relationship with, between vitamin D and iron. So they, they have a very tight relationship. And in the same vein, copper and retinol, vitamin A, have a very powerful alliance in the body. Well, people don't know about that alliance. I just know that, I know vitamin D is really important. And they don't think about, is there a price I'm paying for this vitamin D? Mm. I came across some very important research over the weekend and it's really dated. It's from January of this year. I know it's old. It's four months old already. And, you know, people want to know what's new. But um, the, the whole premise of the study, um, and the lead author's name is Stahlhofer, S-T-A-L-L-H-O-F-E-R, there's a very robust team of people from all over the world. And um, they were talking about how vitamin D, uh, they were looking at the vitamin D status in people who had uh, irritable bowel syndrome or IBD, irritable bowel disease, particularly colitis and Crohn's. And now, but what people may or may not know is that the underlying condition with those types of bowel diseases is inflammation. What is inflammation? It's ineffective energy production. But um, when there is high inflammation, it means that iron is going to be very high. It means that magnesium is going to be low. And it means that the liver is going to have a very hard time making the vitamin, the storage D form of vitamin D. Now, I'm sure people are tracking along with that. Okay, I'm, I'm with you there. Okay. So we need to understand, well, why is inflammation elevated in these conditions? Because there's too much iron. And... The, the whole premise of this study was that by taking vitamin D, because it was low, because of the metabolic conditions of the tissue, they thought they were going to override the intelligence of the body 
And lo and behold, what it did was it suppressed a very important protein uh, called hepcidin, and it increased the expression, expression, not function, expression of ceruloplasmin, or media darling, 15 fold, 15.7 fold, almost 16 fold. And, the, the, and what, what they were concluding was that by taking vitamin D, they increased the level of iron in the blood, and that was victory for them. That's, that's not victory, because what they've done is artificially lowered hepcidin, and they did increase the expression of ceruloplasmin in the intestine, that's a, that's a notable rise, 15.7 fold. But guess what they forgot to measure? The activity level, the function of it. Was it doing anything with all that new iron? And to them, victory was strictly having more iron, because that's a good thing, right? And it's like, wait, everything's in context. Mm. Is, the body, is the body able to regulate that iron? Is the body able to recycle that iron? And they didn't give one consideration to that at all. And that's where a lot of the research breaks down is people are so myopic in what they're looking for. And I think we have to be really, really careful that um, people, that they are easily misled. And we're all guilty of it, misled and misfed. And suddenly we've been trained to think we need more D at the exclusion of understanding what's this doing to retinol in my body. Mm. And as soon as, as soon as you start to exclude retinol, then you're ignoring copper status. And the, the tragedy of that study by Stahlhofer is they're talking about ceruloplasmin, but not talking about whether the functionality and the activity level had gotten better. And it, and it didn't by, by the virtue of the the information they were providing, that the average reader, even the even the most sophisticated reader, wouldn't have picked up on that, because they're going to key in on ceruloplasmin, but not think about ferrooxidase function, and the the tragedy uh, on, in the, on, around the world today is that practitioners do not know that copper and iron are joined at the hip of ceruloplasmin. And actually, there's a wonderful uh, study by Dr. Squiddy, S-Q-U-I-T-T-I, -T -T in 2013, where she talks about um, this known connection between iron metabolism and copper metabolism. And they have this beautiful diagram showing it, it's, like, it's like an elbow. And so you had copper metabolism and, and iron metabolism and the elbow was ceruloplasmin. It's really powerful. And it, it captured the whole essence of it because you can't have one without the other. And in the world of traditional Chinese medicine, copper is referred to as the general and iron is referred to as the foot soldier. Well, we know there's a difference between generals and foot soldiers. Yeah. And so you don't have as many generals as you have foot soldiers, like there are only X hundred, I think it's like 400 generals, uh, at least here in the States, 400 generals, and there's 400,000 foot soldiers. So there's a you know, big difference between the numbers. And the, all the optics apparently are on the foot soldiers, at least here in the States, I, and they may be worldwide, and no consideration given to the general, what, what role they play, and how they've been compromised in this process. Mm. And so if, <clears throat> if the tissue has inflammation, that means it doesn't have good energy production, which would suggest that it doesn't have good bioavailable copper. Well, what's really entertaining about it is they put all this emphasis on this Crohn's disease in this study, C-R-O-H-N apostrophe S. Dr. Crohn identified this many, many years ago at the beginning of the 1900s. And in the world of animals, there's a very 
it's an identical condition. And it's called Jonas disease, J-O-H-N-E apostrophe S. Jonas disease and Crohn's disease are identical. They involve the exact same physiological breakdown. And, and there's a difference between um, medical information and veterinary information. In the world of, of, of animal husbandry, they know that the, that the condition Jonas disease is a classic clinical sign of copper deficiency. In the world of human husbandry, we can't say that because no one's been bold enough to say, even though they, they say that the conditions are the same, and animals have a copper deficiency, humans are copper toxic, don't you know? And that's the breakdown in the world of modern medicine is that the truth is being suppressed by a narrative. And the other very popular narrative is you're vitamin D deficient. And there are some practitioners who, who I have learned about don't even test anymore. They just automatically put their clients on vitamin D supplements, which I, as far as I'm concerned, that's metabolic malpractice. Mm. I think it's a very uh, foolhardy and brash way to conduct their business. And I think people need to be a lot more scrutinizing. I think people need to ask much better questions. And I think people need to demand much better answers. And this idea that everyone is cop, or excuse me, is uh, vitamin D deficient, uh, that's just a myth that needs to be dispelled. And I think it's time to really challenge this narrative. This, it's a global narrative now. Mm. And we just need to be much more forthcoming about what's really going on. Let's talk about it from a physiological standpoint, to about an energy standpoint. And let's really dig in to find out what's going on. And it's in inevitably going to involve iron, magnesium, and copper, and, and retinol. Those are, the, those are going to be the quadrants of uh, consideration. And people just need to begin to belly up to that uh, reality, because this idea that taking vitamin D supplements is going to cure all is very um, risky. It's a risky business. So. I feel like that's a really, a really kind of mic drop moment at the end that, you know, taking vitamin D supplements is going to cure everything is, is risky is I will probably update the description of this video um, with that. I think that that is, um, is really quite potent and powerful. So I'm just going to have a little scroll through and see if there's anything questions wise that I need to run by you. If anybody has any questions. I can't believe there'd be any questions about this. <laughs> if anyone has any questions about vitamin D, please do pop them in. We've got some time to answer a couple of questions today. But what I'd like to do, Molly, whilst I scroll through and, and catch up, um, I just wanted to ask you. So you've mentioned we've got copper, you've got iron, you've talked about retinol, you've talked about ceruloplasmin, you've talked about obviously vitamin D. For the folks who are really familiar with this, perhaps graduates of, of the training and all of that sort of stuff, these concepts are not necessarily the first time they will have heard them. But for the folks who are perhaps fairly new to this, how does the training, because we know that enrollments are open for a couple of extra weeks, um, for our last intake for this year, which is very exciting. How do all of those aspects come into the training? How does the training address what it is that you've kind of touched on today in through the lens, I guess, of vitamin D, but there's obviously a lot more to the story than just, you know, vitamin D alone. So how do those two things connect? And I'll have a quick look through the comments and see if there's anything that I've missed whilst you share that. No, it's a, those are great questions. Um, the focus of the training is, <clears throat> I guess, in a phrase, um, what we teach people to do is ignore the enemies and ignite the energy. We take a very metabolic focus. We're not into medicine. We're trying to revitalize the uh, metabolism of the body because as, as Jerry Tennant in uh, Dallas, Texas, discovered many years ago, healing is voltage. And he's absolutely right. Uh, that, that's his genius. 
and we're just taking a page from his um, concepts, but taking it to another level of understanding. So within that, that construct of creating energy, uh, we spend um, two classes just talking about iron and, and what, what the iron does in the way of creating chaos in the body. Everyone thinks, oh, we've got to venerate iron. It's like, well, well, there's more to the story. Let's spend some time talking about that. We have a, a very deep um, focus on copper and bioavailable copper and what makes it bioavailable. We have an entire class on vitamin D, an entire class on retinol, an, another very intensive uh, class on the mitochondria, which, which we introduced just this year. Um, and it seemed to, to go well. It was a pretty, this was, this was not for the faint of heart. Mm. Uh, I think we had, I don't think we lost any um, students because of it. It was pretty, pretty robust, but I think they all really enjoyed it. So we, we have a very different focus and we're really looking at how these key nutrients intersect and why they're so important and how they really relate to the function of the mitochondria. Again, yeah. if you don't understand how energy is made, you can't really help people get well because that's at the end of the day, uh, our immune system is actually immunometabolism system. Mm -hmm. If the immune system can't make energy, nothing's gonna happen. And that's where we put a lot of focus on really uh, strengthening the, the vitality and the resilience of the um, metabolic process. Mm, thank you for that, Molly. I suspect that um, there's there's a lot to to say on the subject because, of course, the whole training goes in much deeper to each of these different aspects. But thank you for for painting that picture for us. Um, what I've picked up just having a little bit of a scroll through through the comments is that um, we're having a little bit of trouble with comments. A few people have had to really turn their audio up um, loud today. So yeah, just if, if you're having trouble hearing, headphones are always really helpful. Turning up the volume is also really helpful as well. Um, we've got a few folks who can hear just fine. So I think it's a device specific thing as well. Um, but if you are having trouble, yeah, extra volume always helps and, and headphones do help as well. So um, I haven't, because we're, we've got, Aries has said, um, are they closed for questions, unable to write comments? I think it might just be, we might just have some tech gremlins, gremlins joining <laughs> us today. <laughs> Lovely, that's great. Keeping things interesting. But if you do have a question, I so, for the record, um, I, I messaged Christian. So Christian is our operations manager who co-facilitates the training with Morley. And she's always here when we're live and she's like our ninja behind the scenes and checking things and looking things up. And I stay in touch with her. Um, on one of, who are you talking about? Totally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and I stay in touch with her on one of my other screens whilst Molly and I are chatting because um, she's doing other bits and pieces. So I can see that there's some questions coming in, so I'll um, I'll grab that in just a second. Um, but I can't um, she, could, she could break away from her birthday cake that's coming up. I, it's just I'm just amazed that she would do that. <laughs> yes, it is a special week for Kristen. Her birthday is on Thursday, so please join oh, me in wishing her a happy birthday. Birthday, birthday month. I think birthday month. Is. Yes, right. yes. The whole of June we will celebrate Kristen. So. Please join us in wishing her a very, very happy birthday this week. Um, but I did check in with her and I couldn't actually see any comments when I first jumped in. So I had to go out and come back in again as well. So I think there's just some, some tech gremlins going on today, but I do have some questions. So just give me a moment, Molly. Andrew said, where is Molly's ponytail? Lol. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's behind my head is where it is. That's where <laughs> All right. We have got a question. Are we ready? Indeed, let's do it. Always ready. You were born ready, Morley. Okay, so Aries says, is zinc the same explanation as vitamin D? My doctor asks me to take zinc as it is low, and he said Hashimoto's patients absolutely need D and zinc for sure. Thoughts, please. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> well, Hashimoto's is an autoimmune condition. What does autoimmune mean? Well, we're back to the same cast of characters. Uh, the, there's a very wicked intersection between uh, low energy production, iron, and drum roll, brrr, parasites. 
Um, I think the question I always back to your doctor is, why are they low? Why? And just see what they have to say. Um, I would I would be very slow to respond to that, those directives mm. with, what I, with what I know. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Hopefully that gives you some some I don't even know what the right word is for you Aries um I think like if I were in Aries's position uh, I I think that's a really empowering thing to kind of offer back Molly so yeah. um yeah like like clarifying and questioning and as you mentioned earlier like we as well, let me let me take, take it down another level because I, I don't want to I'm not trying to be playful Aries I'm not trying to be coy I'm, I'm just trying to be mindful of the, of the uh, time we have but mm. What's usually in play in thyroid problems is a conflict in the liver. It has nothing to do with the thyroid. And so the conversion of, of T4 to T3 is very critical, as you well know. That's where 90% of it takes place. Well, people who have thyroid issues have copper issues, period. So if copper's low, iron's gonna build in the liver. That's a fact. So if iron's building in the liver, it's going to put tremendous pressure on magnesium in the liver. And when magnesium starts to leave the liver, the liver has to make certain enzymes work that require a plus two valence. And when, when the magnesium plus two is not there, it starts to grab zinc, because that's a plus two. And so zinc will show low in a stressed out body. Why? Because iron is dominating the liver and creating all sorts of metabolic chaos. So I just, there's, a lot of switchbacks there, I get that. But this idea that um, your doctor has command of all this, I would wonder, and I'd, I'd be happy to talk with them. And I've, I've made that offer to hundreds of clients. And I've actually talked to three MDs in my entire career, well, since I've been doing this work. All three were women, doctors. All three asked me to slow down so they could take notes, literally. And all three said, I wish I had learned this in medical school. So there's more to the story and you just need to be more curious and um, insistent with your doctor to find out what's going on. Mm. Thank you for that, Molly. Yeah. Um, and because of all of the, the tech gremlins, I did miss um, a comment. Thank you, Christian, for flagging that. So we do have one that came through from Sandra. So this is back from when you were talking about the vitamin D discussion, obviously at the beginning there, Molly. Um, and Sandra's question is, do genetic mutations change any of this? So my apologies, Sandra, for missing that. Um, there is some weird and wonderful things happening today with our conversation, but this will probably be just checking the time, our last question for today. So. Do, gene do genetic mutations change any of this? And obviously you shared quite a lot at the start there, Molly, but is there anything that you can add for Sandra there? Well, I think we have to be real careful about the phrase genetic mutations. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I could, if we had an hour. <laughs> <laughs> but so real simply, we have genetics. And what's above genetics is called epigenetics, the environment in which the genes find themselves. But what's above epigenetics? Energetics. And if the energetics of the tissue is improper, it will change methylation patterns, which will then change uh, genetic patterns. And what we're also learning, um, literally as we speak, doing a, a deep dive into um, gene mutations and what's really behind them, <clears throat> only to discover that there are uh, a number of key um, genes that have what are called copper binding sites. And if the copper is not present at a binding site, well, the gene doesn't express right. Oh, and, and when we find out that, that there are certain um, nucleotides, guanine has an absolute preference for copper. If copper is not present, uh, guanine is not as stable as it's supposed to be. And then we find out that the, the whole process of histone metabolism, which is the unfolding of the genome, 
unfurling of the genome, it's copper dependent. So I think there's a lot more to this story than we've been led to believe. I think it's a lot more uh, energy dependent, but it's also copper dependent. Mm -hmm. And what, what I learned from a very important copper researcher, uh, his name was Greg Gregoriadis. I always stumble on his name, <laughs> Dr. G. Dr. G. Uh, he was at the University of London. Uh, in 1968, he published a very important study on the copper distribution of liver cells. Liver cells are called hepatocytes. And he wanted to see what, where, where does copper show up in the liver cell? Within the cell, where is it hanging out? Two places. Two places. The mitochondria, which makes perfect sense, given the metabolic demand. But in, in his words, what had equal distribution with the mitochondria was the amount of copper in the nucleus. This was 1968, folks. What do you think they know some 60 years later? So I think we've been grossly misled, and there's a lot more to the story. And I wouldn't, I don't buy the gene uh, defect uh, issue. I'd like to know more about the individual. I'd like to know about their stress. I'd like to know about their diet. I'd like to know what medications they're taking because I think there's many factors. I just, again, I was talking to a client today and it was 45 minutes into the conversation. He says, oh, I know what happened because we we're trying to figure out what, what was the event. He went to India in 2001 and he got they suspected he had malaria. Now, I can't believe they did this, but they did. They gave him Cipro for malaria. That would be like the worst possible thing you could do for someone. And, and so he was never the same after that. And for the folks who don't know what Cipro is, it's Ciprofloxin. It's a fluoroquinolone. And they're very powerful and very destructive to copper and magnesium status in the human body. Almost like, almost like they planned it. And so um, it's important for people to know that there is more to the story and yeah. to be, be more willing to ask those questions to find out what else is going on that I'm not aware of. So that's, mm -hmm. not, that's not a precise answer to your question, but I think we've, we've got some additional factors to consider now and maybe in a subsequent conversation, whether it's here or in the RCP community or in class or whatever, it'd be fun to explore that deeper. Yeah, absolutely. Mm, and I find that that happens a lot. There's there's often a, a question that seems quite simple that comes through, but of course there's so many things to consider when looking to answer that seemingly simple question that is part of the process of the RCP. It's like unlearning what we think we know, again, using that beautiful Mark Twain quote again, and then actually here are some other considerations that we need to, to look at. Um, and I think that from, from what I understand about the, the Institute training, there's a lot of that that happens. We spend a lot oh, of time absolutely. unlearning. Yeah. That's, that's the most important part of the training. Yeah. You know, uh, people think they can come in and stuff in this new information on top of what they know. And mm. it's just, they've got to let go of what they do know because it's based on faulty assumptions and faulty conclusions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that is all we have time for today. So as we mentioned, we do have a couple of weeks left for enrollments for the RCP Institute. So if you do want to train with this man and learn or unlearn, should we say, <laughs> just this is just a little taste test of what we do in that training. There's 16 weeks. There's a couple of practical integration weeks in there. So lots and lots of, of um, classes in there. The link in the description of this video is what will take you to the page. It's got lots of information about the training. So if this has piqued your curiosity and you'd like to learn a little bit more, click on that link and it'll take you to those details. If you're looking for dates and payments and all of that sort of stuff, have a look through that page. There's a lot of information there. Um, it's been built based upon the kinds of questions that we get. This is a very popular training. It grows every time 
that we run it, the interest, you know, the EOI waitlist that we open up when enrollments are closed continues to grow. So I suspect that uh, this movement will continue to gain more and more traction as we continue to focus more and more on, on our health and what's actually really going on. Absolutely. And we've got over 180 people signed up for this next class. And yeah. we're just um, less beyond measure. We're very grateful yeah. and very happy to, to be here to help people learn this material. Yeah, absolutely. Well, on that note, we will close it up. Thank you. Um, we won't be able to obviously address all the questions, but as always, if you're an LCPC and you can you can address some of those questions or direct the questions to a resource, maybe the premium community where you can have Molly answer those specific questions, come and, you know, come and play. There's lots of ways to get your questions answered. Um, so we'll be back again next week. If there's anything that you need in the meantime, pop your comments in, contact us, whatever suits you, especially if you've got questions about the training because it is a time sensitive thing. We'll be back next week. Morley, it's a pleasure. Thank you for sharing all of this insight and wisdom with us every week. Thanks, Shanae. You take care. Yeah, take care, everybody. We'll see you again soon. Bye for now.